Talks, uh, Keeping Our Oceans Healthy with Dr. Octo uh, Octavio Aburto Oropesa. Oropesa. How am I doing on that name? <laughs> so uh, just a few housekeeping things first. Um, I'm Betty Wheeler. I am the newly minted uh, president of the Del Mar Foundation. And I'm really delighted to uh, be introducing this talk. Uh, DMF Talks was founded by the foundation in 2012, I believe, when we really focused in on the fact that we have such a deep bench in our area, in Del Mar and, and very close to us um, in this area of, of uh, creative, intellectual, and scientific leaders. And so we thought that having a speaker series uh, would be a terrific way to use this um, a very robust resource that we have in our area to entertain, inspire, and inform the Del Mar community. And certainly tonight's speaker uh, falls squarely within um, the vision that we had when we started the series of being able to bring superb um, speakers and, and people who are doing uh, terrific work in, in science, for example, uh, to come and share their work with us. So just a few housekeeping matters before we start. Uh, first, if you can uh, keep your computer on mute um, during the presentation, that will help a lot to make sure that everyone can hear as clearly as possible. Um, you may also, if you want to, um, turn off your um, hit stop video. You will still be able to see the speaker and what he's sharing on the screen, um, but it might help pre preserve some bandwidth for, for the program. Um, let's see, if you have questions that you would like to ask the speaker, we're asking you to put those in the chat box. So if you look at the, toward the bottom of your screen, kind of in this, there's a center icon called chat. Just click on that and type in your question. And we will be um, providing those questions to the speaker after he uh, finishes with his presentation. And I know he would love to take questions and uh, do Q and A with us. Um, I think that's it for, for the housekeeping and, um, so let me just say a word about tonight's program. I'm very delighted to introduce Octavio Aburto Oropesa. He is a marine ecologist, um, assistant professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography just down the road from us. One more thing I might suggest is if you want to put your, to get the best, don't do it now while I'm talking, but when our speaker is talking, Use the speaker view, which should be usually up in the right hand, upper right corner, so that you can fully uh, see his presentation. That will, I think, will help you get the best view. All right, so uh, Dr. Aburto, professor at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, um, where he is the director of the Gulf of California Marine Program. He is also a senior fellow uh, conservation photographer for the International League of Conservation Photographers, National Geographic Explorer. Um, if you go to his website, which is just as uh, very simple, it's his name, OctavioAburto.com. He has a wonderful tagline there that says, using science to influence conservation. And so I think you'll find as you listen to him speak and, and maybe go and visit his website or or whatever, you will see that uh, in, in his scientific work and in his photography, it is dedicated uh, to using science to influence conservation. And um, I just happened to find an example um, that I found very interesting of some of his scientific work. It was published, it's some original research paper that was published just five days ago in the Frontiers in Marine Science. That's a wonderful title. I don't know why it sounded to me like a COVID appropriate title. Being isolated and protected is better than just being isolated. <laughs> a case study from the Alacranes Reef, Mexico. And it's a wonderful paper. It, um, it's a bit over my head scientifically, but um, I'm sure almost everybody else on this call uh, would really enjoy it. And so it takes a look at isolated reefs, which typically in the past have been uh, more pristine because the isolation has protected them, but they are under increasing threat. And so this study looked at whether isolation um, alone uh, protects these uh, pillars of natural diversity or 
whether adding a layer of protection, whether it's a no-take zone or a marine protected area or something like that, um, serves better to, to preserve those areas. And so this paper is a great example of how protecting the last wild marine places in the world is a crucial step necessary to preserve biodiversity. I think you could find that online and would find it very interesting. Um, so I hope you will, uh, his topic of course is keeping our oceans healthy. Um, I hope you will join me in giving a very warm Delmar welcome to Dr. Octavio Aburto Oropesa. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, for the invitation and for this introduction. Um, actually you did great. This is basically what the paper uh, says and and actually you will see along my presentation that um, really I don't do rocket science. I enjoy more to share um, this science and, and the knowledge with, with many people, especially because we, we need a lot of people uh, to care about the, the health of the ocean. So I'm gonna start sharing my, my screen. I have two videos that I want to share with you. So I will, I will share uh, my screen and I will share my, um, the, the whole technology. I hope that nothing happened during this presentation. Um, but if you cannot hear something or you actually have a question, just let me know um, and I can just, just interrupt me. So let's start sharing my screen. So, well, I arrived to, to San Diego almost 20 years ago and, um, and I came to do my PhD here at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and basically I never left. Uh, I came to do my PhD in in mangroves, and I will speak about that. But after, but after my PhD, I got a postdoctoral research um, position, and then um, a research scientist position. And now I got a faculty position. In 2013, I got this faculty position. So um, I have been here in San Diego um, for a long of a lot of time, but before I came here, actually I started working with, with the scripts when I was studying marine biology in, in Mexico. So I, I studied in, in La Paz, in Baja, and the Birch Aquarium in that time used to have a program that support Mexican students uh, to understand the, the reefs in the Gulf of California. So as you can see, I was, I, I am there on, on the left top corner of this slide, uh, basically 30 years ago, when I still have hair and I was very young. Uh, and I was sit there with Don, Donna Wilkie, Don Wilkie that used to be the, the, the director of the Beach Aquarium and very recently passed away. But he helped us a lot, me and many students, Mexican students. So I want to make a, a, a recognition of that. And as you can see in this slide as well, the Birch Aquarium donated these two, two cameras, very old technology, the, but I started doing my photography and videography with these cameras. And if you push the forward button, uh, like, almost 15, 13 years later, I, I came here to Scripps to do my PhD and I did it with, uh, with this very interesting topic, very great ecosystem that are mangrove forests. I will, I will talk more about this, this ecosystem, but the first minute that I jump into the water inside this uh, ecosystem, I, I got amazed about this ecosystem. So I have been studying uh, mangroves since um, basically 20 years ago. And, and also enjoying marine life. And as 
um, it was mentioned, I started also taking photography. So I received the, the cameras to do science, but slowly I corrupted myself and start using the cameras to, to capture the beauty of, of the ocean, the beauty of um, the, the marine life, especially because uh, my mother that uh, lives in Mexico City, very far from the ocean. And, and when I left home, uh, she always wanted to know what I was doing. So <laughs> I started using the photography to, to ensure, to tell her that I was, I was doing the, I was studying and, and I was doing nice things. So basically what I want to um, mention today is uh, just remember that the ocean give us a lot of services, give us basically the air we breathe, we breathe, we breathe um, to, to molecules of the three molecules that we breathe every time that that we breathe oxygen comes from the ocean and everything related with the climate regulation comes from the ocean. And as you know, we live very close to the ocean. So transportation, recreation, a, a huge economy. It's, it's, um, it's generated by the oceans, but as you also, also know, um, we are facing many, many big issues with the ocean. So it's, it's the moment, it's, uh, it's this year, and I hope uh, next year we, we set the path in the next decade to change many things that we have done about the ocean and start caring more about the ocean and protecting the ocean. So today I want to share with you three topics. Uh, I want to um, share with you two topics that, that I believe are, are very, very important to, to, to change the, the way, the path, that we have in this planet, the sardines and the mangroves. Uh, these two uh, topics are, don't necessarily have a, a, a very nice ending, um, but I want to finish my presentation with, so, with a positive message because I think um, everything can be, can be changed. So sardines, mangroves, and then marine protected areas. Let's start with, with sardines. Um, Basically, sardines it are very, very important for, for the oceans. It's, it's be the, the huge schools that you can see in, in, on the water sometimes are unbelievable. They form these amazing uh, balls of fish. And, and of course, everything in, in the ocean uh, relies in this, in this fish. And that is the reason why uh, sardines, mackerels, anchovies, uh, all of these small fish can be or, or have been named forest fish. Basically, these forest fish, they eat the tiny things in the ocean, the phytoplankton and the zooplankton, and they accumulate all this energy in their bodies. And because they are very, very dense, it's the abundance is incredible. The rest of the the food web in the ocean, any, anything that you can imagine feed on these uh, small fish. So whales, fishes, birds, everything. And this is the, the, the reason why we should care about sardines. When they exploit, when they uh, basically grow amazingly in many areas, especially in the Gulf of California, at the end of the year is when we start seeing the juveniles, the larvae of all these sardines, you start seeing all the fish. Many fish migrate following uh, this big concentration of, of sardines. And around the world, there are very few special places where you can see these uh, amazing um, natural events. Yes, and the Gulf of California is one. And California used to be one, but, but again, we have overexploited overexploited many of these um, areas and we don't see any more these kind of spectacles. But if you see, if you go to the Gulf of California, you can still see these amazing uh, events. And, and as I say, jacks, snappers, groupers, sharks, many things uh, feed on them. 
and especially seabirds, seabirds that not only um, migrate from very far place in the, in, in the globe. And, and you will see this video that I will present um, um, about sardines, but this one is a tern that come from, from Chile, from Peru. They come all the way just to breed in the Gulf of California because the amount of sardines that they can find here. Um, so all these bears, all this life is connected with, with, the, with the sardines and with the anchovies. And this is the reason why we can see spectacles like this. Uh, in the video, you will see this very tiny island in the Gulf of California that support half a million birds just nesting in a very, very tiny area. And this, this is, there are many strategies why they do that, but one is to avoid pre uh, predators. But also humans uh, enjoy sardines. And in some way you can, you can see that diving inside a huge group of sardines, it's, it's a way to enjoy this fish. But the problem is that we enjoy them as well in, in the fisheries or for our food. And that could be okay if the fishery is done in a, in a reasonable way. The problem is that, for example, in the Gulf of California operates only 50 boats and they can catch a lot of sardine in just one night. They have the technology now to, to catch all these all this fish. And sometimes people, when, when we have these discussions about fisheries, People always mention that fisheries are, or fishermen are traditional sectors of our cultures and societies. And I agree with that. The problem is that what we are seeing right now with the industrial fisheries is not what used to be uh, this idea of the fishermen and the culture and the, and the important sector of the society. In the Gulf of California, for example, in, the, in this video that you will see, and it's already 10 years. We did this video um, almost 10 years ago, and we were referring to this number, 10 um, million tons of sardines extracted from the ocean. It's like you can fill a lot of football stadiums with that. And you can, maybe you, we can start arguing or discussing about the importance of that to feed people. But the problem is that the majority of these sardine is being used to feed other animals, not, not people. So 85% of all these sardines uh, are used to feed chickens, pigs, cows, and even farm fish. Um, one time I was in the Mexican Senate uh, presenting all these results and the owner of one of the boats of sardines, he said that why I was complaining about that if at the end, the chicken, the pigs, and the, the cows are, are, are used to feed humans. And I say, well, the problem is the transformation of the energy. Because if you use one kilo or one pound of sardine in order to feed farm fish, you can, you can produce, um, well, in other words, in order to produce 1.1 pounds of fish, um, um, sorry, one pound of fish, you need to use 1.1 1 .1, uh, pounds of, of sardines. But the problem is when you, you want to, to generate one pound of pig, you need almost three pounds of sardines to generate that amount. Or uh, the worst is the, is the cattle. Yes, you need, in order to generate one pound of, of beef, you need almost seven pounds of sardines in order to generate that. So if the problem is the transformation, how we use the transformation. And remember that when you extract all this amount of fish from the water, maybe to benefit people to feed on chickens, pigs, and, and beef, uh, you also eliminate that a source of energy for other groups like whales, dolphins, or seabirds. So let me let me show you this. This video is part of a series that we have that is called the Natural Numbers 
uh, initiative. And basically, these are small videos that explain this, um, these ideas in a very, very short video. So we produce three minute videos to uh, share with people um, what are these problems. So let me, let me show you the first one that is about sardines. Sardines are small pelagic fish with huge populations that aggregate in dense groupings. They provide essential food for larger fish, marine mammals and seabirds, especially during their breeding seasons. In the midriff region, the most productive waters of the Gulf of California, sardines form giant schools. In Rasa, a small flat island of less than one square kilometer, the way sardines support marine and coastal ecosystems is revealed. Rasa is the nesting site of 95% of the world's population of Herman's gulls and elegant terns. Every spring, Herman's gulls arrive from southern Canada all along the North American Pacific coast. Meanwhile, elegant terns migrate to Rasa from the coast of Chile and Peru. There is a very strong link between the sardine populations, the composition of seabirds diet, and their breeding success. Can you imagine the amount of sardines needed to sustain the wonderful wildlife spectacle of Rasa Island? Every bird in the island feeds on 20 small sardines a day, which on the whole weigh around 120 grams. This means that the half million birds that breed in Rasa need at least 60 tons of sardines each day. Rasa Island is a natural thermometer of the health of the ocean and a highly valuable tool for the management of the sardine fishery. If the sardine population dwindles, the seabirds cannot get enough food for their ever hungry chicks and nesting success declines. Seabirds can be used to predict total fishery landings, catches per boat and the composition of fish species in the catch. But unfortunately, this information has not been used. Sardines have been fished almost unlimitedly, threatening the survival of other ecosystem components. One single fishing boat catches an average of 60 tons of sardine in one night. And there are 50 fishing boats working in the region, which jointly may catch more than 3,000 tons of sardines in a single night. According to Mexico's National Commission of Fisheries, a total of 10.5 million tons of sardines were caught in 20 years, between 1990 and 2010. A volume of fish that would cover the needs of animal protein for the whole population of Mexico during one year. In order to procure this catch, the fleet received around $20 million in fuel subsidy and spewed more than 100,000 tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Subsidizing a fleet of 50 boats to fish these disproportionate amounts of sardines seems an unwise use of a marine resource. Especially when considering that about 85% of the total sardine catch is used to feed chicken, pigs, cows and farmed fish. Is this the best way to use our good sardines? Why should you care about the health of the ocean? Well, this is the first um, video that I'm going to show you. But as you as you saw in the video, basically summarize what I was uh, telling you about the importance of the of the sardines. And unfortunately, we haven't solved that um, that big issue. How to how to have fisheries connected with sardines, but at the same time, giving more for the ecosystems rather than. Uh, destroy or waste all the energy in the way that we are using the sardines. And then the next topic is the mangroves. And in some ways happening 
um, the same. Mangroves are a very, very important resource. It's, uh, as you can see in this picture, mangroves are trees that are living in the interface between the ocean and the land. And for that reason, they have a lot of ecosystem services that, or they, or they provide us a lot of services for humans, like protection and other things that I will show you. Um, so when I, before I arrived to Scripps to do my PhD, as I mentioned to you, I got um, in love, I, I was amazed by this ecosystem. And since 20 or, or more years, I have been studying mangroves in, in many ways. If you ask me really, really what, why these this trees are amazing or why you are amazed by these trees, what you are seeing here is um, a juvenile plant. Basically, the seed of the mangroves uh, germinates before they detach it from, from the mother tree. And as you can see, this, this mangrove um, propagule, propagule or juvenile, it's already, it has like a, uh, a rocket. It's like a rocket, upside down rocket that in the moments that the conditions are right, they detach and, and go straight uh, to the to the mud or the sand. And this, this propagule will originate a new plant. But even if they don't attach directly, they can drift for some, uh, for some days. And when they uh, are able to, to attach to something, even volcanic uh, area, you can see that the propagule they start um, growing and, and basically you will have another tree. But because they have this reproduction strategy, just with, with one plant, like you can see here in this picture, 100 years later, you can have this. It's really, really amazing. It's, they can create a, a coastal lagoons. They can create a huge protection to the coastal areas. And as you can see, they trap water. They, they, they create an ecosystem for many, many species. And many species find refuge inside these, these lagoons. But as you can see in the picture, and this is one of the, the most interesting service for me, is how these roots come into the water and they serve as, as uh, like an arms protecting this juvenile fish. And mangroves basically are cataloged as the most important nursery area for many, many coastal fisheries. So not only fish, but also blue crabs and, and shrimp and many other species. And as you can see, uh, once they uh, grow inside these, these mangrove roots, they move to offshore reefs and it's when we humans um, exploit them or, or receive the benefits of this uh, protection. So my thesis here in, at Scripps was to understand these benefits, these, the fishery benefits of mangroves for uh, local fisheries. And this is one of the, mm, pro probably the most important publication of my thesis. Uh, and as you can see here in this boring graph, you have the area of the mangrove and the landings in the whole um, in Northwest Mexico or, or the area, the green areas that you can see here in the map. What this, what this graph or what this slide is saying basically can, can be translated in this slide. Uh, for each hectare of mangrove, healthy mangrove that you have in the Gulf of California, fishermen receive $37,500,000 per year in fishery products, in fish and blue crabs. Uh, they, that is the whole amount of, of, of landings that these mangroves generate. And if you multiply these landings by, by the price and, and then do some, um, not, not necessarily back to the envelope estimation, but some very simple maths, you can arrive to these, to these numbers. And, and in the same way, there are other services that actually nowadays are more, more important. Like for example, they also sequester a lot of carbon from the atmosphere. 
And as you can see here in this uh, slide, the mangroves in the Gulf of California that are related with very arid conditions. There, there are the majority of the Baja California Peninsula and the Sonoran Desert basically are desertic uh, ecosystems. So mangroves, they don't have too, too much um, fresh water input. So they only grow very, they don't, they don't grow very tall as you can see in the tropics other other mangrove forests that can uh, reach up to 40 meters in, in, in high. So, but even, even with that small um, um, size, they sequester, they continue to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. But something that we found in this paper is that they uh, have been growing on top of themselves for millennia. Um, there are some uh, coastal lagoons in the Gulf of California that have been, um, these mangroves have been growing on top of themselves for 5,000 years. And basically they have been accumulating all these leaves and all this um, organic material that again is, is basically the result of the sequest sequestering the carbon. Scientists use these uh, devices that are called um, Corers and basically they obtain a, um, a sample of the of the sediments. It's you can dig very deep with these uh, corers. This is this is called a Russian corer, and we have been um, we have obtained like three meters or four meters of of samples um, with using this device, and you can we we sample in different places in the, in, within this forest. Sometimes it's very difficult to, to, to dig, but once we obtain the, the, the sample, scientists, uh, we bring these um, sediments and, and study the, the carbon content in, in the lab, they dry the samples, and then we, we obtain the estimation of, of how much carbon is, is, is there. So basically this quarter is, is like a time, time machine, yes? Because you can go in time in the moment that this carbon was sequestered, uh, going just one centimeter in this moth or in these um, sediments is like traveling uh, 10 years. And, and again, if you go uh, three or four meters is like traveling 2000, 3000 or 4000 years back in, in the history of this uh, ecosystem. So this is the reason why not only losing a hectare of mangrove, it's bad because this tree is a machine to sequester the carbon from the atmosphere. If you remove all this sediment, you are bringing back uh, 3,000 or 4,000 um, years old carbon that have, have been there in these sediments. So this is the importance. So now you have a picture of, uh, I, I gave you um, an idea of what is the value of mangrove, uh, one hectare of mangrove for fisheries, for sequestration, it could be like $2,000 um, per year, just sequestering carbon. But there are other services like hurricane protection, erosion, water uh, purification, biodiversity. And it's a huge value. People, scientists say that this value could be above $100,000 per hectare per year. And look at what is happening in many regions. This is a picture in, in the Gulf of California. In, a, in just one weekend, um, a urban co um, a construction company, they destroy all these hectares of mangroves to, to start this, this project. And this is human uh, urban development, but also shrimp farming. This is the other, the other big problem. Palm oil industry is the other big issue. So agriculture is a big issue for mangroves and especially uh, palm oil. That is something that we are using more and more often for fast food and many other things that actually are very bad for our health. And of course, climate change is, is now threatening these ecosystems. So these are the, the, the combination of, of problems that we are seeing
for mangroves and losing, we are losing uh, a lot of mangrove. In the, in the last 50 years, we have, um, we have lost 50% of all the mangroves that we have in this planet. Ah. That is the reason why we need to do a lot of things to, to solve this, this problem. So let me show you uh, this other video that you will, it will give you the, the whole picture that I just have mentioned to you. Mangroves are trees that have evolved to survive in flooded coastal environments. Where the salt and the lack of oxygen make life impossible for other plants, these trees prosper, offering shelter and food to numerous other species. An enigmatic and silent microcosm that extends from dwarf trees in the deserts of Baja California to 40-meter giants in the coastal forests of Chiapas. Mexico is one of the countries with most mangroves in the world. For years, these ecosystems were considered unhealthy breeding grounds for mosquitoes with no value for society. Today, we know that this fragile tangle of life generates valuable ecosystem services. A hectare of mangroves is capable of producing up to 20 tons of leaf litter in a year, a larger yield than that of the most productive pasture lands. The excess in leaf litter accumulates in the root network, where it forms a carbon reserve 50 times larger than that captured by a tropical forest. This organic material serves as food for some of the main fisheries of Mexico, like shrimp, blue crab, snapper or snooks, which find refuge during their juvenile phases between the long submerged roots. These roots, firmly anchored to the mud, absorb up to 90% of the energy of the waves, mitigating the impact of hurricanes in coastal communities. Mangroves are a giant biological filter that purifies water in estuaries. They retain nutrients and sediments from the rivers, creating habitat for other species that ultimately support the ecotourism industry, a successful development model for many coastal communities. These services can reach an annual value of $100,000 per hectare, which means that the more than 700,000 hectares of mangroves in Mexico contribute every year to the national economy with $70 billion. However, thousands of hectares are still being raised to replace them with shrimp farms, agro-industrial plantations, or mega-developments. Reforestation initiatives are proposed as a remedy to the devastation, but restoring a single hectare of mangrove costs thousands of dollars, and a century is needed for it to restore its services back to full capacity. At the current deforestation levels, in 25 years, close to 50% of Mexico's mangroves will have been lost. Is it really necessary that our idea of progress should imply the destruction of natural ecosystems? Visit thenaturalnumbers.org. Well, this is the, the other story. Again, uh, together with sardines and mangroves, we need to start doing a lot of efforts to restore these um, very, very important um, ocean resources. But again, as I don't want to, to finish my story with um, a negative message, and actually I will spend the rest of my presentation um, telling you that we have, science also have demonstrated that uh, it is possible to revert uh, all these things, but not only that, um, people is the one that, that have been doing this uh, big experiment, this trans uh, transformation of, of this recovery of the ocean. So it's not necessarily ex scientists experiments, it's really, really the participation of the people. What um, we know that um, make possible these changes. So this picture that you see here, I took it in 2012. And this picture was taken in 
in a very, very tiny community that is called Cabo Pumo. It's in, in almost in the tip of Baja California Peninsula. It's uh, like one hour and a half north Cabo San Lucas inside the Gulf of California. And I spent uh, together with, with the, the person, the diver that is in this picture, I spent like three years, we spent three years to get these conditions, to get the conditions in order to take this picture. Why we work very hard to take this picture because there, there is a very, very important story to tell with this um, picture. So the, the first thing, or there are different stories. I'm, I'm gonna mention some of them. The first, the first one is that the name of the diver is David. David, um, David Castro, that it's um, a junk uh, dive master in the Cabo Pumo community. I have been diving with him for the last 15 or 20 years. And his name is David. And that is the reason why I choose the name of David and Goliath uh, for this picture. And David and Goliath was a um, um, metaphor that I wanted to, to, to tell with this, with this picture not only from the human side of the picture, also from um, the, the, the big challenges that we are facing in, in many ways. So let me, let me tell you two stories about this picture. The first one is about the fish. Why the fish are doing um, this, it's, are doing this behavior or, or performing this, this behavior. And the reason is that they are in a mating season, in reproduction season. So at the end of the year, between September and, and, and November, they start forming these, uh, these um, big groups and, and they, they perform these dances, this courtship behavior. Uh, something that I forget to mention is that this area has uh, 25 years. This year is the 25th anniversary that Cabo Pumo doesn't have. Um, it's, a, it's a national park, but also the people that live in Cabo Pumo decided to don't fish inside the national park. So it's really, really a true not take marine reserve. So this amount of fish that you see here not only is the result of how the fish gather in order to reproduce, also it's a natural uh, density, a natural abundance of the fish because they, they haven't been fish for all this time. So the, what you see here is basically as scientists, uh, we call this a, it's a natural experiment, a natural laboratory to study what is happening with a, with a healthy population of these fish. So these fish gather in this big concentration during the, the, the moon side, especially the, sorry, the full moon of um, September, uh, October, and November. And basically they perform this, this behavior. At the beginning, they form this river of fish very close to the surface. You can see even the, like the reflection of of, of the, the fish in the, in the surface of the water. And here is David uh, snorkeling with this fish. In one moment they decide and they start going down to, to the reefs. Uh, we don't know how or when they, they decide that, but the, the whole river of fish start moving now on the bottom, uh, very close to the, to the rocky reefs, but also as you can see in the sandy bottoms of, of the park. So being there is a, a it's an amazing uh, experience because you you really can see all this energy. Uh, the fish they have only one objective that is to reproduce. So they are concentrated in in all this in in this dance in this uh, courtship behavior. So in one moment, very close to the full moon, they decide to start doing this big uh, ball of fish. And it's in some way the, the tornado that you saw at the, in the first image. But this big ball of fish start gyring. And you can see here, all the fish start gyring. And in some moments you see a pair of fish going out of the ball. 
Uh, one is now black and one remains silver. The black is the male and the silver is the female. And when all the, all the pairs are formed, basically what is the picture is like this, is uh, all the females with the males and the males like the shadow of, of the females. And we never have seen the, the moment where they spawn. We don't know if uh, all together come and, and spawn as happen in many species, or if they spawn in pairs. Uh, most likely they spawn all, all together because uh, you know, uh, um, releasing eggs um, into the water, eggs and sperm into the water you need a lot of concentration of that in order to get more fertilization. So unfortunately, we haven't seen that moment, but this is what you see, this, all this energy, and this is the story behind what is happening with the fish. And as many other fish, the larvae basically grow in the open water, then the, the juveniles or the small fish go to the coastal areas, they find the mangroves, they live inside the mangroves, and then they go back to shallow reefs and then the, the reef, and then they perform this spawning aggregation. So you can see here the whole cycle. And now I already told you about what happened when humans don't understand the importance of mangroves. But the other part that humans don't understand is, is this moment of the spawning aggregation. It could be very simple. You can imagine if all the fish are gathering come to that place and just release a net and get everything. So here is one story that we published um, back in 2011, showing that the majority of the fisheries in the Gulf of California for this kind of fish, they perform spawning aggregations. And in the months where they perform this reproduction or in the reproduction season is when the majority of the landings are recorded. So this is uh, basically as simple, you can see behind the, the gill net, behind the picture, you can see the gill net and in, in a very, very few hours or, or minutes, you can get all these fish because why they are in reproduction. And this is one picture that you can take once uh, fish spanning aggregation is, is caught. And the problem is that what you can see here are the sperm and the eggs when the fish are being cleaned. And, um, and basically the eggs and the sperm never will uh, be fertilized and never will replenish the population. So this is something that we need to change. Now, the other part of the story is uh, the diver. And again, the name is David, but David has a family. David is the one that it's in, in the right side of the, of the picture, if, if you see the picture, well, in the left side of the picture, if you see the picture in this way. Um, and, uh, and his father, uh, Mario Castro, is the one that uh, basically convinced the, his brothers and his father to protect the reef. Why? Because 25 years, 30 years ago, they, re, they already overfished the reef. And they understood that there, were, there wasn't any more a way to live in with a reef that was overfished. And they requested uh, the Mexican government to put this national park. The first years of this protection were not the, the it, it wasn't a, a beautiful story or a nice story, but five, Eight years later, the changes start um, happening. And is when I, I saw it as well, because I have been, I know these guys for 30 years at least, because I, when I was a student with the Birch Aquarium, uh, I, I, we visited that place. So I, I met these guys, I met Mario, the, uh, David's father. And, and, I, and we know that was overfished that way. So when all these changes start happening, I was very, very happy. So I, um, my postdoctoral researcher here at the Scripps was to understand the changes in, in that community. And this graph that you can see here is basically the change between 
Cabo Pumo in 1999 compared with 2009, and the rest of the areas, the open access and the core zones that are other reefs inside other marine protected areas that are multi-use, they are not no tail. So as you can see here in this graph, only or the, especially the marine areas that are no take are the ones that really, really are changing or, or are recovering in the way that we need. And again, this graph is very boring, but you can see the pictures of Cabo Pumo. If you jump into the waters of Cabo Pumo, you will see pictures like this. Big, big amount of fish, a large amount of fishes. Um, this grouper that it's, um, it's, um, it's a Goliath, but it's not the Goliath grouper, but it's a, it's a very, very big, huge, uh, it's the Gulf grouper. It's, it can reach up to 2.5 meters in length. They feed on these other guys, the grunts, but they're huge animals. You can see the sardines every, every end of the year. The sardines feed on all these, the rest of the fishes. You can see the amount of fish, the, the parrot fishes and the surgeon fishes that are the gardeners of the reefs, uh, cleaning the rocks, cleaning the areas for corals, uh, big amounts of groupers hunting with other uh, moray eels. And of course the big animals have returned, the, the, the sharks. Sharks are, the most important species in the reefs. If you have sharks, you will have healthy uh, marine um, or reef uh, food webs. And that is the importance of, of all the sharks. And every year now we see more and more sharks coming to Cabo Pumo. And this is one of the, the signs that this area is healthy. And for that reason, this area has become um, the uh, one of the most famous area uh, in, in Mexico and around the world, as you can see here in this picture. And the most important thing is that, the, that these guys from Cabo Pumo are very, very smart because what they are doing now is to bring people to enjoy the reefs inside the marine park, but also they continue fishing outside the park. So it's not that they had to uh, stop fishing, but now they do it in a way that they allow marine life to continue uh, growing and they receive the benefits outside the park. And more and more often, more people want to go and visit Cabo Pumo because they, you can see turtles, you can see many things and you can dive with sharks. In the past and for many generations, we were told by movies that sharks are very bad and and, and, um, and we don't want them, but actually it's completely the opposite. And it's, we, we fish 100 million sharks every year in this planet. And we need to stop that. We need to change that. And actually the majority of the divers that are paying more and more um, money is because they want to dive with sharks and they visit places like Cabo Pumo. So here is David enjoying uh, this dive with bull sharks, and and actually the big dream is to protect all the all the sharks in in Cabo Pumo. So this is basically the story. These are the jacks from Cabo Pumo, and I think they more and more uh, they are attracting uh, people from all around the world and generating a lot of um, economic benefits for the whole town. So this is the. My, my presentation, um, this, all these ideas or all these uh, images that I, that I show you are part of a big initiative that is called Mares Mexicanos, Mexican Seas. And basically I'm, I'm doing a lot of, of things just to create more awareness about the importance of, of the oceans. And I am involved in more, um, not only Mexican young, uh, people also Latin American students to really make a great change um, in, in the ocean. So thank you very much. And if you have questions, I will, happy, I will be happy to answer them. All right. So thank you so much, Octavio, for that presentation. We do have one question that came in in advance. 
and it is this. Your title, Keeping Our Oceans Healthy, implies that they are healthy. Are they? Um, no, in fact, none. <laughs> it's completely the opposite. Um, for example, in the Gulf of California, another study that I have is using Cabo Pumo as, as a baseline to understand what is the degradation that we have in the whole reefs in the Gulf of California. Basically 70% of the reefs in the Gulf of California are in a degraded state. So it's completely the opposite, but I think the, as, as uh, one time I heard this, this phrase and, and always I try to repeat it, um, we should leave the pessimism for better times and, and we, we should use the optimism to convince more people that it's possible to have uh, healthy oceans. Right, here's a question that just came in. Um, very inspiring. How can Del Mar residents contribute to this conservation effort? Well, I think um, more than ever, uh, we should make an effort uh, to connect with, with people. If, if something, if something uh, good will will arrive there, there will be many good things from this pandemia time times but uh, if there is something that I am uh, inspired about what we have learned along all these months is that we have as a, as a society as a, as a humanity we have the technology already to connect with more people and to inspire big changes in favor of this planet. Um, I, I am pushing, I, I was before the pandemic, but now I am pushing more inside institutions like Scripps and UCSD to, to basically make more efforts to, to connect with with the students, with, with young people that they don't have the possibility to come and study within walls, within buildings. But this pandemic shows that, that we are already set to, to reach every student in, in this planet. So why not to start thinking in how uh, Foundation, foundations like Delmar Foundation start putting together um, this kind of efforts, but for a young um, people that cannot come to institutions or to schools like UCSD or Scripps and bring all this knowledge to them rather than them <laughs> come to study inside walls. So I think uh, groups like you, foundations like you uh, can start thinking in supporting programs that rather than have a, a, a facility or, or something that is very expensive, now we can create virtually more impact um, and, and, and need is possible. So one idea is, is that. And that is the reason why I why accepted this invitation because I think um, foundations, Delmar foundations can start thinking in, in, in this way. So we have a couple of comments here. Uh, this presentation is extremely eye-opening. We need to get the word out. And I think you just shared with us some concepts for that. And then another comment, very interesting and amazing photos. Thank you so much. We will do our best to keep the oceans healthy. Um, I'm just curious if you have some thoughts on, on that. I mean, what are, what are the things that we can do to, be, to make conscious decisions to keep our oceans healthy? Well, um, I think, um, of course, um, 
this pandemia also having has been telling us that we need to make uh, a lot of efforts or huge efforts to change uh, our um, consumption behavior to, to change in many ways, um, but also our uh, habits about um, the, the things that we eat, the, our, our health in general. And I think if we go back to these moments of the societies where we don't depend or we, we depend less on things that are hurt, hurting the environment, that will be also a great change. So right now there is a big discussion, like, like I say, uh, do, we need this, do we need these industrial fisheries just um, taking so much from the oceans and wasting all this energy in the way that I show you? In the same way, um, it will be difficult, but it, it is possible uh, to start in the same way that we are talking about that we need to reduce our uh, fossil fuel consumption and, and start thinking in more green energies. We also need to start uh, saying more loudly about our consumption of beef. And we need to reduce our consumption of, of meat, not only because healthy reasons, also because uh, this uh, having um, this big industry is basically um, destroying our forest and our, our um, landscapes and, and more, more resources are being con consumed just by having more consumption or, or, or the consumption of meat that we already have. So we need to return to, to start eating more veggies and, and start a, doing this, this kind of changes in our personal lives. And that will help a lot for this environment. But if, if we really want to change massively, um, we need to concentrate in, in, in the next generations. They are already aware about what is happening, how we can support them in order to make these big changes that we will need in the next 10 years. That is that is something that we need to think about. And, and again, Del Mar Foundation for the entire community of Del Mar or the entire San Diego region, it could improve, it could uh, make a huge impact, especially for young uh, people that um, can be rich with all these seminars or, or all these um, um, broadcasting events. Here's another question. You probably know that on our northern uh, border here in Del Mar, we have the uh, San Dieguito Lagoon. And the question is, is it possible for our lagoon to establish mangroves? Well, so the, the, this question is very, very interesting, very important in, in many ways. Um, mangroves are tropical species. Uh, so they don't resist um, the, the cold and, and weather. Um, so, so this is one thing. However, now more and more often we are seeing that areas like San Diego are getting warmer. Remember that two years ago we got the record in the warm waters. Here Scripps has uh, a record of 100 years um, measuring the temperature in the waters in the pier. And two years ago, we, we reached one of the records. And in Florida, we are seeing that the mangroves are moving towards the north because the warming of the oceans and the warming of the conditions. So in some way, maybe in the near future, if we continue these trends, we will have mangroves. This is something that not necessarily we want. But the other thing is that there have been projects um, um, putting the idea that we can create 
hectares of mangroves, artificial hectares of mangroves in order to sequester more carbon from the atmosphere. So there is an experiment actually in the Salk Institute here in, in, a, in very close to Scripps, uh, together with, with the Scripps researchers trying to, to see if we can create these artificial mangrove uh, areas in order to sequester more carbon and help climate change. So in some way, this question uh, connects with, with these three, three answers that I just gave. Very good. All right, I'm not seeing more questions in the box, but I, uh, I do comment. Hello, can you hear me? I put, I, I don't know how to get it in the box. I just wanted to tell him, I belong to the Scripps Aquarium and they have monthly talks. This talk was so important. I'm going to present his name to them. So they get about uh, 100 to 200 people attending. So I'm hope, hoping that he will take a time to go present the same facts to them. All right, and one more comment came in very informative. Thanks so very much. And another one, this presentation is extremely eye-opening. So um, just as a reminder uh, to everyone, if you found this presentation something you want to recommend to others, um, it will be um, on the Del Mar Foundation's website uh, probably within the day. I'm looking for a nod from Hilton. Um, and so we will all be able to recommend it to, to others to see also. Um, so I think we're ready to conclude, but uh, Dr. Aburto, we want to thank you so very much for your time. This was an extremely interesting and informative presentation. And I hope that people here will find ways to um, integrate the messages that you presented to us into, into uh, the decisions that we make and what we do in terms of conservation. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much for the invitation. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Bye-bye, right. everyone. Bye.